Hello, good evening. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Bhavna and I'm from Fertility Dost. We are back again to spread more fertility awareness in our, uh, in our, in our community. And this time we'll be talking about IVF. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Send me a quick hi or an emoji so that I know people are joining. We'll wait for some more time till the time we see some people joining us. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So our topic for life today is how to prepare for IVF treatment. So in case if you have any questions regarding IVF, you can comment us down. Uh, we'll be having Dr. Divya Shri with us who will be explaining us what is IVF, the process, who should opt for IVF, who should not opt for IVF, the precautions that you need to take, and everything re related to IVF. So all your doubts and queries will be answered by Dr. Divya herself. Meantime, Sarah, send us your questions. Okay. Good evening again. This is Bhavna here from Fertility Dost, and today we'll be discussing about IVF. So, if in case you're going through IVF and you have questions regarding the process, uh, the things you need to take care about, precautions, or anything related to IVF preparation, you can send us your questions to discuss the same about how to prepare for IVF. Today we have Dr. Divya Shri with us and she'll be explaining us about IVF, the myths regarding it and in detail about IVF. So I would request Dr. Divya Shri to join us on screen. Dr. Divashri is having 16 years of experience and she'll be joining us soon. And she'll, hello ma'am, good evening. Hi Bhavna and hi everyone. We have Today. Dr. Divashri with us. I'll just give a quick introduction about her. Dr. Divashri is the medical director at Genia Fertility Center, Bangalore. She is the re recipient of the future of art as well as she has contributed and is part of the fellowship teaching program at Genia and Milan. Along with this, Madam is member of State Board Art and Surrogacy Act 2021 and is also a secretary of Indian Fertility Society Karnataka chapter. 
Ma'am has got total 16 years of experience into infertility, whereas her expertise is about infertility and recurrent implantation failure. Dr. Divya Shri, with so much to say about you, we are glad that you have joined us uh, for this topic where we'll be discussing how to prepare for IVF treatment. Lots of things are about IVF, there's lots of myths and there's a lot of uh, hype also about the same, whether it's really helpful or not. So ma'am, can you just help us and our viewers to understand what is the IVF process? Yeah, uh, again, uh, good evening all of you. Uh, yes, this is an emotional journey. Uh, it's an emotional roller coaster when people go through this infertility journey, and especially when they're going through IVF. There are lots of doubts, anxiety, and whether it is going to work or not. So there are lots of doubts, and they just go through a lot of emotional roller coaster because initially, why for me? Why infertility for me? Why only me? My peer, uh, uh, everyone has got uh, married at the right time. They have got children at the right time. Why for this pregnancy, I have to struggle a lot. So already those who are facing this issue are emotionally weak. They are anxious. They are depressed. So uh, and this IVF is totally new to them. And obviously, there will be a lot of anxiety and stress within them. So uh, what is this IVF and why do we have to do this IVF? If we have to understand, there are mainly four indications for an IVF. Initially, do you know when uh, Louis Brown was born in 1979, the IVF was done for tubal factor infertility, which means that both the tubes were blocked. So initially, IVF, in vitro fertilization, was done for tubal factor infertility. When the tubes are blocked, egg and sperm cannot meet. So when the egg and sperm cannot meet, embryos cannot form. That is what, that, which means the fertilization cannot happen inside the womb, that is inside the tube. So that is why we, this in vivo fertilization is not happening. So we had to do in vitro fertilization. So the main mm -hmm. indication for IVF till date is tubal factor infertility, which means the tubes are blocked. Why do you think tubes are blocked? Most commonly, the tubes are blocked because of hydrogenic or it is blocked purposefully. For example, when it, when people go through family planning operation, that they have uh, you know delivered one child or two children, and after that they want some contraception, they want the tubes to be blocked artificially. So that's called tubectomy. That's the most common reason. Or it could get affected because of infections. India is a country where tuberculosis is not very uncommon. Tuberculosis is the most common reason why tubes can get blocked. Most of us think that TB can affect only lungs but it can affect mm -hmm. any organ in the body and reproductive organs are not spared. And among the reproductive organs, which is uterus, tube, ovary, cervix, vagina, tube is the most commonly affected organ uh, by tuberculosis. So when, uh, tubes, uh, when the tuberculosis affects the fallopian tube, it can get blocked. It's not just tuberculosis. It could be other genital infections like chlamydia infection. It could be gonorrhea or any other sexually transmitted diseases which can affect the tube. Or it could be a surgery. For example, a woman has gone through appendicectomy procedure when she was young and it has caused adhesions. In that case also, tube can get blocked or the tube and ovary relationship gets altered. Most of the times in endometriosis, there will be adhesion. The tube can get adherent to something else. So that could be the reason. Or there could be dilatation of the tube called hydrosalpings. So put, to put it in a nutshell, the most common uh, indication, the initial indication with which the IVF was started was tubal factor infertility where the tubes are damaged or blocked. The second indication is endometriosis. What is endometriosis? endometriosis uh, imagine uh, you you get menses every month you you all know that you get menses every month mm. In, uh, when you get menses the blood from the uterus flows out through the cervix and the vagina but if the bleeding happens inside the pelvic cavity which could be in the ovaries it could be in the peritoneal surface wherever it is if the bleeding happens the menstrual bleeding happens inside there is no passage for it to come out so the menstrual blood keeps on accumulating so whenever there is bleeding there is inflammation and adhesion for example you get a cut on the skin how does it heal it heals with inflammation there will be a lot of redness and you know there will be pain and uh, then it heals right so the same way mm -hmm. whenever the bleeding is there inside that's called as endometriosis 
in endometriosis again there are different stages one two three four if it is stage three or four endometriosis again it's an indication for ivf so that's the second indication then what is the third indication it is severe male factor infertility where a man has got severe um, uh, decrease in count or it is it could be even azoospermia where there are no sperms in the sample or it is just one or two million um, count on the semen test then also it's an indication for IVF and if you ask me why because normally when people have intercourse millions of sperms get deposited in the vagina when it enters the uterus it is lax when it enters the when the sperm enters the tubes it is probably hundreds to thousands. So to fertilize one egg, we have to have hundreds and thousands of sperms surrounding the egg. So when the sperms which are getting deposited in the vagina itself is less. So the mm -hmm. uh, probability of sperms reaching the um, egg in the tube will be very less. So that's how the probability can come down. And needless to say, when it is azospermia, when there are no sperms in the semen sample, then obviously there is no um, scope for fertilization and subsequent pregnancy. So when it is a severe male factor infertility, a sperm cannot fertilize the egg on its own. Here we have to do it artificially. We have to take the egg mm -hmm. and inject the egg with sperm. Individually one egg with one sperm. That's called as intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is one step ahead than IVF. So that's also an indication for IVF, which is severe male factor. So to just a quick recap so far, the first indication is tubal factor. The second indication is stage three or four endometriosis. The third indication is uh, severe male, male factor infertility. infertility. True. And that too, it is severe. Not all mild male factor infertilities are indications for IVF, but it is severe male factor infertility. And the last indication is unexplained. I would, uh, in uh, in medical terminology, it is called as unexplained. I would call this, call it as unexplored infertility, wherein uh, there is no such reason why pregnancy is not happening. How, how do we term this or coin this term unexplained infertility is when the basic investigations are normal, which means a woman is ovulating. She's having regular menstrual cycle. Her egg reserve is okay. She's got good number of eggs. Then, also, the cement analysis is normal and the tubes are not blocked. These are the three basic investigations for us to say that she's not having any cause, explainable cause for infertility. That's called as unexplained infertility. So whenever there is an unexplained infertility, first thing is we, what do we do? We just track the ovulation and we tell them try naturally or we give them medications, mm -hmm. few medications. So that instead of one egg, she releases two eggs and then tell them to try naturally. That's called as timed intercourse. If timed intercourse doesn't work, then we tell do an IUI procedure. That is intrauterine insemination. Why do we do an IUI? We are trying to increase the probability of pregnancy by increasing the number of gametes, that is eggs and sperms, which are available for fertilization. By doing an IUI, we are increasing the sperms, which are available for fertilization around the time of ovulation. So when time intercourse fails, when IUI fails, that is when we resort to IVF. So in unexplained infertility, where previous uh, medications have failed or previous interventions have failed, that is also an indication why we have to do an IVF. In unexplained infertility, needless to say, it also includes polycystic ovaries. What happens in polycystic ovarian syndrome? A woman does not ovulate regularly. So the simple treatment in the polycystic ovarian syndrome is to induce ovulation, to give medication so that she ovulates at the right time and we tell them to have intercourse. If that fails, then we step up the treatment to ovulation induction, which means we make sure that the egg gets released and we do an IUI. When IUI also doesn't work, then almost she comes into the category of unexplained infertility because we don't know why pregnancy is not happening. If the basic defect was just ovulation problem, she should have conceived with ovulation induction programs. So if, she's, if it's not working with the routine treatment, then also we step up to IVF. So the uh, four indications for infertility is when it is um, uh, the first indication, as I told you, is the blocked first one, fallopian tube. The blocked sure. fallopian tube. The second one is severe endometriosis, that is stage three and four, severe male factor infertility, and unexplained infertility where the previous treatment modalities have failed. True. So for all the viewers, ma'am has even concluded it that there are four reasons and need not be every endometriosis stage has to end up for IVF treatment. She has uh, very well explained that it has to be the stage three and four and not the one and two, as well as 
uh then there are male infertility also where it has to be a severe cases only on the cases where there is severity where they have tried everything and then there is ivf for all these cases where it is blocked fallopian tubes endometriosis male infertility as well as unexplained infertility ma'am i really like the way we have put on it it is unexplored infertility the side which is not explored and that has caused them infertility so once it's explored with the right doctor your infertility is just gone this is, is what is uh, beautifully ma'am has put it across um now that we have talked about it who can opt for ivf or what are the cases who can opt for ivf we would like to uh, hear about the entire ivf process so people who are opting for ivf process can ask us about any other questions that you have ma'am would not be explaining us what is the ivf process step by step yeah so ivf process here i would like to segment this process okay one is preparation for an ivf which i'll take it later and the ivf procedure per se and that is still egg pickup and after that preparation for embryo transfer so let us understand uh, up to how till egg pickup what are the steps which are involved there are different protocols for an ivf so why is that ivf is so complicated if you think naturally every woman will release one egg yes or no so with one egg we cannot work with these uh, um, eggs and sperms it is just that we are we just get a get one embryo but believe me the first ivf baby which is born that is louis brown in 1979 was with a natural cycle one egg was picked up it was injected with one sperm it formed one embryo and resulted in a pregnancy and this baby she has delivered normally she has conceived normally mm. okay so yeah. um, so we but it is a herculean task just to deal with one egg because lot of financial um, aspects are involved in this and lot of laboratory processes are involved in this so if we have more number of eggs we can work on them sufficiently so that we get more number of embryos so why do we have to get more number of embryos it is because we are looking at a cumulative pregnancy rate because True. with one ivf when we do one embryo transfer wherever it is wherever in the world the best ivf center can give a probability of 40 to 50% in an indicated hmm. ivf so which means 50% would fail this is the reality which we have to understand so if you have to do repeated embryo transfers we have to have more embryos more the merrier when we have more embryos we can keep repeating this embryo transfers cycle after cycle so if we have to get more embryos we have to have more eggs sperms we will get because sperms are in million when with one ejaculate we get millions of sperms but we have to have more eggs right so if we have to have more eggs we have to ha give injections every uh, menstrual cycle it a recruitment happens which means um, few cohort or group of follicles will enter the process of you know uh, ovulation but only one can make it why it is because the other subordinary follicles or subsidiary follicles will go through atresia or they die why is it that so because only one particular follicle or one particular egg can respond to the lowest dose of gonadotropins which is released from the pituitary that's in the brain so if we increase this fsh dosage even the subsidiary follicles can grow so that we get mm -hmm. more and more eggs so, so for this what we do we usually the most common protocol is we start the injection from second day of menses which so the injections will uh, be there every day every day injections will be there and how many days of injections minimum 8 days to maximum 12 days of injections will be there which has to be taken from second day of menses and in between the response is going to be assessed and how do we assess this response by doing a scan that is the most common modality of assessing the response we can also do blood test to correlate whether it is correlating with the hormones one mm -hmm. follicle if it gives an e2 value or the estradiol value of say 100 in its initial stage so if we have five follicles we should have 500 uh, value as the e2 and on scan we assess the size of the follicle follicle is just the, the, it's like a fluid filled balloon in which egg will be there egg is not visible on ultrasound it's a microscopic structure when we do the egg pickup we can see that under the microscope so we do the assessment once in 3 days 2 days 4 days depending on how many eggs she has and what is the rate of development then in between we may do two to three scans 
and we may hmm. do two to black Sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. We have just got a question from our live audience where she is asking the same question on the same line where she's saying she has got PCOD. So in case of these hormonal injections that she will be also injected in the coming future where she's planning her own IVF cycle, the number of eggs that a PCOD patient gets as in comparison to a normal patient who is not suffering from PCOD are the same or it may differ? The, the number as well as the question. quality of egg. It's an excellent question. PCOS means there are polycystic ovaries, which means there are many number of eggs. To have very less number of eggs or to have many number of eggs is also a problem. It should not be too less or it should not be too many. As uh, uh, our patient has rightly suggested that, yes, PCOS will have more number of eggs. So they will get more number of eggs when we retrieve. So uh, it's, it's in a way it is good because as I told you, mm -hmm. it's more. Yeah, but it comes with a risk that is called as ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome wherein if we have too many follicles the ovaries can get too huge and there could be fluid accumulation in the tummy there could be you know vomiting and there could be concentration of blood which can lead to other complications associated with ohss so a woman mm -hmm. with pcos will definitely have more number of eggs compared to a woman who is having normal egg reserve or who is having less egg reserve so uh, accordingly complications are also higher that is why when we True. start the injections we have to be very vigilant about what is the mm. dose that she requires and how do we decide okay. on the dose it depends on what is the age of the patient what is the body mass index or what is her height and weight accordingly we have to calculate the dosage what is the amh level in a pco amh is going to be high so my dosage is going to be lesser and how did she mm. respond to the previous cycle? Most of these patients, when they come to us for IVF, especially in tertiary centers like us, they would have actually gone through one or two IVFs before and failed. And then that is when they come to us. Or at least they have gone through IUI procedures. When we mm. look at these stimulation protocols, we almost understand with what dosage, what is the threshold dosage for this particular woman. So that is how we have to decide on the dosage. So once we decide True. on the dosage, these injections will be given for 8 to 12 days in between monitoring will be done and we give the final injection called the trigger. It could be either a HCG trigger or it could be called mm. as on trigger and then once the trigger is given after 35 to 34 to say 36 hours after the final injection we do the egg pickup procedure. Egg pickup procedure Which is, is the second, just, second step? No, it, we are you just, we just name it? Okay. Okay. Then we segmented that one is the up to egg pickup. So till the egg pickup. Mm -hmm. So now the injections are over. Now we are getting ready for egg pickup. So mm -hmm. egg pickup is a simple procedure. It's not something like it's a very uh, big procedure where we have to do a laparoscopy or we have to cut open the tummy and take. No, when we most of our women who are suffering from infertility are very familiar with transvaginal scans. Right. So when we do the transvaginal yeah. scan through the same transvaginal probe, a small needle will be passed, which enters through the vagina and enters the ovary, especially when it is a stimulated ovary, it is going to be much easily accessible. And we just puncture these follicles and retrieve these eggs. So this eggs will get it will just drop into the test tube. That's why the term uh, the, the terminology test tube baby came from. So the, the okay. egg drops into the test tube from the test tube. We uh, segregate it into the petri dishes and then we actually um, observe that in the lab so this is how egg pickup is done and it will be done under a uh, small anesthesia procedures many a times it can be done even under local anesthesia but most of our patients are already apprehensive so that's why we prefer to give sedation which means they are sleeping during the procedure it's not like intubation procedures where they are totally paralyzed it's only that they get into deep sleep Hardly this procedure takes 5 to maximum 10 minutes and then okay. the eggs are retrieved. So this is uh, the first stage. The first stage gets over. After we have just got the same question in, this, in a similar way. There is this woman who is saying that she is a working woman and she's saying that will I be able to go to office the next day? Absolutely. Absolutely. Whether you are going through injections or going through a pickup, the uh, same day, I would not advise you to go because you will feel drunk uh, because of the effect <laughs> of anesthesia. Um, you know, it's a 
it's a you know free ride of uh, getting mm. stoned with anesthesia it is just the same feel uh, for some yeah. it can be a very pleasant feel for some it can be uh, you know not very pleasant but however sure. uh, we would not advise them to drive or work on the same day of uh, the procedure but the subsequent the next immediate next day they can go for work it is not just yeah. after the procedure. even during your uh, procedure of going through injections you can self administer these injections because they are all subcutaneous injections it's just like taking insulin injections most of the diabetic patients they mm -hmm. administer injections themselves right the same way women can administer the injections themselves and just come for monitoring one or two days basically it has to be friendly patient friendly there should not be much of waiting mm. time uh, going to meet the doctor and then getting the drugs administered it should be very friendly so uh, that's how it is and uh, as i was uh, coming back to the uh, you know uh, explanation of what happens the after neck picker because most of you will be uh, you know uh, apprehensive what will they do with our gametes because they are little human beings they are going to be sure. our future children how are they going to deal with our gametes so these eggs are like they're very sensitive naturally these eggs are meant to be in a closed environment where it should be dark and it should be maintained mm -hmm. at a core body temperature of 30 our core body temperature is 37 degrees centigrade so it has to be maintained in that temperature it should not be exposed to light it should not be exposed to you know uh, uh, colder temperatures and particular ph has to be maintained so that is what is done in the ivf lab which is the core of any ivf procedure so it's a uh, it's like a sacred place ivf lab is a sacred place where too many uh, communications are not allowed too many people cannot enter the ivf lab where all these small small little human beings are preserved so these eggs are immediately uh, because these eggs have gone through a shock naturally these eggs are not meant to be going through this you know pressure line and then falling into the test tube so they are totally shocked so we have to keep them in the incubator for some time so that they get stabilized after that then it will mm -hmm. be taken out right? it when it comes outside it comes as an oocyte cumulus complex the supporting cells also get surrounded the egg that will be denuded the oocyte will be separated from this cumulus complex then either it is uh, uh, icsi procedure is done where single sperm is injected into the egg artificially that is the icsi procedure but if it is an ivf procedure the oocyte cumulus complex will be left with the lacks of sperm so that sperm fertilizes the egg on its own then we observe this fertilization 24 hours or 12 to 24 hours in this time gap whether it has formed a zygote that is egg is an individual cell sperm is an individual cell when they meet together they for, should form a single cell called zygote from this single cell it should become two cell two should become four four should become eight then it should become a compaction stage embryo called morula then it should become a blastocyst so overall in this five days journey is what it happens in the ivf lab so after that either we transfer the embryos back to the uterus or we freeze them as i told you uh, we uh, try to get as many eggs as possible but it should not be over zealous and it should not exceed say 12 to 15 eggs the healthy uh, numbers are somewhere between 5 to 15 it should not be beyond 15 that's called as ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome as one of our previous uh, lady asked that she is a pco yes she can get True. more than 15 but that is the duty of a doctor to mitigate that kind of a hyper response and make uh, to get them back to the track that is to just have say 10 to 15 eggs is what a good number so uh, okay. if we get for example if we get 10 eggs okay it is not that every egg will get fertilized and every egg or the fertilized egg will become a fifth ray embryo usually mm -hmm. 80% is the probability if we get 10 we should have something like 7 to 8 blastocysts provided it is a healthy egg ivf is both mm -hmm. diagnostic and therapeutic as, as i told you unexplored or unexplained infertility when we do an ivf we get a lot of answers many a times sure. we get to know what is the quality of the egg it's very easy to diagnose male infertility tell me why because just by giving a sample we can understand how the sperms are what is the number what is the motility what is the quality how many are dead how many are alive but to we cannot do that with an with an egg if we have to sure. understand what is the quality of the egg we have to retrieve it outside so ivf is a good opportunity for us to study the egg how the eggs are looking like whether they are mature enough they are having any abnormalities within the egg or outside the egg the supporting cells is the sperm and egg interacting with each other 
are they getting fertilized or after the formation whether the embryos are getting formed or not so we get a lot of information we are just running a little and short of time ma'am i'll just take up this question which is related to our content uh, our discussion right now but the, where the patient is saying that she was recommended to have a three day embryo transfer wherein uh, we are emphasizing here on the fifth day transfer so she is asking us where we'll just give a quick reply to our viewers because we have a little uh, short of time yes, so right. what how to pick up the best embryo for the transfer whether it's a day three or a day five there is nothing like uh, one size fits all I'm not saying we have to do a blastocyst transfer. We do both eight cell, that is third day transfer and fifth day transfer. That depends on your treating doctor because mm -hmm. many a times it's a better incubator for the embryo to grow. And many a times we want to study the embryos further. What is happening? What is going wrong with the embryos? Is it really good that it could get implanted? So that is when we suggest a blastocyst transfer. And even the, if we look at the evidence, whether it is day three embryo or day five embryo, the implantation or the live birth rates are the same. So it's nothing like day three only mm -hmm. has to be done, day five only has to be done. There's nothing like that. So just quickly, if I have Great. to complete, so once the embryos are yes. formed, then this preparation for the embryo transfer, which could be either in a fresh cycle or a frozen embryo transfer, wherein we prepare the lining, make sure that the lining is good, and then transfer the embryos back into the uterus. So this explains the whole IVF process. Great. So to the viewers who have been asking us whether it's a day three or a day five, it depends upon your condition as well as what the doctor has felt is the right uh, embryo to transfer to increase the chances of implantation. Having said that, uh, there is also questions which our viewers have asked us in the community that uh, why does an IVF fail? And this is the right question to ask you because you have got an expertise in recurrent implantation failure. So I'm sure ma'am can explain this question to our viewers. This is my favorite question. I want all of uh, our patients who are going through an IVF to be prepared for a failure. For this, you have to understand what is a normal human fecundity, which means what is the ability of a human being to achieve pregnancy in one menstrual cycle. 100 couple are trying for pregnancy this month. Whether all 100 will achieve pregnancy? The answer is hmm. no. Because only out of these 100, 15 to 20 maximum will achieve a pregnancy. The rest of the 80 will not achieve pregnancy. Does it mean they have problems? No. What will they do? They will try again next month. Does it mean all the 80 will get pregnant in the second month? No. Another 10 may get pregnant. So another 70 will try for the third month. So when they keep trying at the end of one year, the probability increases. 80 of them would conceive, right? The same way. And it is the normal, it is nature. That's how God has made us. For example, if you take a cockroach, if you take a mice which enters our house, how fast they uh, reproduce? They produce litters. A cat delivers six kittens. A dog delivers six puppies because they have a shorter lifespan. Sure. So, to maintain their progeny, they have to produce quicker, they have to produce, reproduce a lot. Compared to an elephant, you know, the fecundity of an elephant is much lesser than a human being because they live much longer, for a longer duration mm. of time compared to human beings. And the True. total duration of pregnancy is much longer for an elephant. So, as, uh, as, a, as a living being in this nature, in this universe, we come with a fixed fecundity rate of 15 to 20%. So, in an IVF, we have come through an IVF because there is an indication which, with all these four and uh, with all the probabilities, with the highest expertise and the uh, finest embryology lab, what we can attain is only 50%. When you enter an IVF, I want you all to be aware of this probability of pregnancy because it's very important to understand what is the actual pregnancy probability we True. enter this with this pregnancy True. thinking that IVF is a panacea and i'm going to get pregnant 100 percent and we raise our expectations like this and when it comes to comes uh, when it comes as a negative result, boom, we just drop from 10th floor that is what is the problem which all of our patients are facing so we have to understand 50 percent is the probability of pregnancy but there is mm. something called cumulative pregnancy rate so when it fails for the first time when we do an embryo transfer second time the probability goes up to 75 percent when we do it for the third time the probability goes up to 87.5 percent which is close to 90 percent so this is what we have True. to understand because even with an ivf the probability of pregnancy is 50 percent each cycle 
and so even it's very the important for English to understand. I give doesn't give a hundred percent uh, solution to it, exactly. though you have to be patient. But doctor, as you were just saying it, and I wanted to uh, you know emphasize and highlight this particular thing is, as you're saying, the patient needs to be aware and they should be prepared rather that it's not going to be a hundred percent. Though we are not saying that every time it's going to be a failure, the chances are high that you might have to go for a second chances. And if the IVF fails, the feeling is as good as falling from the tenth floor. So. Preparation is the key. So how would you like to say in a holistic way? I mean, always there are injections and there is a preconception test always helping them out. But do you think holistic way will help them out to prepare well for the IVF? And if it's holistic, how they should prepare? Definitely. See, first of all, have a healthy lifestyle. Most of you are most of the times glued to internet or most of you are so workaholics. Most of our patients, they tell us how often do you have sex? How often do you meet? They tell us uh, we are, you know, we, we can meet you in the clinic. That's the time when we get to meet together. Then how do you expect them to get pregnant? So first of all, exactly. spend time with yourself, understand each other. And it is a spiritual process both for doctors and patients. So uh, meditate a lot, exercise a lot, and cut down on the calories. First, be healthy. Because most of the times True. what you people do, or most of our patients do is to just become you know, stagnant. They just go to bed rest, which is totally, totally you know, a, a blunder to do. I don't advise mm -hmm. any of my patients to take bed rest any of my patients to just keep taking injections no you have to be very active because remember if you exercise there is good blood flow to the system anything whether it is heart whether it is kidney when you exercise there is good blood flow to the system how is uterus a different organ uterus also needs blood supply when uterus gets blood supply True. embryo gets blood supply right so if you are exercising then your uterus gets better blood supply and that's how the probability of pregnancy can be higher so prepare uh, psychologically and then, uh, get pregnant for your own sake not uh, to prove the world or uh, not to prove others that okay even i can get pregnant you want or uh, exactly. not the peer pressure or the family pressure you want to have a baby what is the right time to have a baby when you want to have a baby and we are here to help you sure. and uh, uh, as i told you diet exercise uh, mental preparedness or to be calm to be prepared for a negative result when you prepare for the worst best things would happen to you don't have too true, much true. of a high expectation beautifully said rather. exactly so that's how so it's a holistic want, preparation uh, true and it's as well as with holistic, it's also mentally pre getting prepared and being prepared for the worst as well will help you to go through this journey. And as doctor has very rightly said that it's you're not ill that you need to go for a bench rest rather. You have to be active. You're going through a spiritual journey. Uh, and you have put it very uh, beautifully, doctor. I would rather say that IVF is nothing that you have to get scared of or you have to be like, oh my God, I'm going through IVF. I have to take leaves. I have to go home. I have to rest. Nothing I'll do. No, it's it's the opposite. You have to be more active. You have to prepare yourself. Your body should be active. A proper diet has to be there. You have to maintain your BMI. You have to maintain your exercise and mobility and as well as mental preparations. So if you're prepared in this way, only then you can have your IVF in a better chances of success, rather, I would say. There was this last question coming up who said that 50% chances in the first IVF cycle only or how? So I would say ma'am has given a lot of explanation that it's also the cumulative chances of success that you get with each cycle that you go by. So uh, and preparation is the key, as we have mentioned that the, our topic was how to prepare for the IVF treatment. So how do you prepare this? You have to prepare by yourself, by thinking and giving importance to yourself as well as to your spouse and not just going and meeting the doctors in the clinic because you won't get pregnant like that is what doctor has said us. So thank you so much, doctor, for giving us your time. It was wonderful talking to you. You have given us so much insights and have explained in detail. I hope viewers have uh, noted it down. And in case if you have any queries or you would like to meet Dr. Divya Shri or consult her, do let us know. Thank you, Dr. Divya Shri. Have a great thank evening. You. Thank you so much. And whoever is going through this journey of IVF, I wish them all a uh, uh, you know, happy journey through this parenthood. Uh, and IVF is a different, uh, it's a different choreography. It's an altered choreography, but that does not mean it's abnormal. So you, you will exactly. get pregnant. It's just that positivity within you, which keeps you going. Great. So with this positivity, we are signing off. Yes. Good day. Thank you. Bye. All. Bye. 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 Bye.